Stanford University. Thanks very much, John, and welcome. Uh, good morning and welcome back to the, to the farm and to this morning's panel on life-changing technologies. I would like to introduce our panelists, Tom Rando. I think Tom is out there. Roy P. Sally Benson. <laughs> Sam Gambier. <laughs> and Chris Gertis. <laughs> it may be appropriate to frame a panel on life-changing technologies with a passage from Thomas Jefferson, uh, a great man for life-changing ideas and also a man who profoundly understood the power and economy of ideas. It was almost 200 years ago in just a, a letter, a, a piece of correspondence, that Jefferson wrote, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights his candle at mine receives light without darkening me. Universities, particularly great universities, are about lighting that first candle, but they are also about lending that candle to light the candles of generations of succeeding students. Universities are in the curious business of both creating knowledge and transmitting it. And I'm sure I needn't tell you that there are few intellectual joys greater than being a student in a classroom taught by people who are responsible for the very discoveries that they are teaching. Our classroom today is large, but our instructors are experienced and their ideas are challenging, from molecular spy networks to designing smart cars, from reversing the aging process to technologies for enhanced learning to green energy. So let's begin at once. We start with Tom Rando. Thank you, Paul. It's my great honor to be addressing this uh, distinguished audience. Um, I have the privilege at Stanford of serving as the deputy director of the Stanford Center on Longevity. And our mission there is lofty through science and technology to assure that we all achieve old age mentally sharp, physically fit, and financially secure. <laughs> I think we can do this. And as a biologist, my area of interest is in, of course, the physically fit part of that. And I'll talk to you today about our research in aging and stem cells and the intersection of those areas of research that have led to, uh, I think, the challenge of this colloquium of basically life-changing technologies. So aging is a curious process, and it's puzzled scientists well forever. Um, how we age, the causes of aging, is a central mystery of biology. Why we age has been elusive for evolutionary theorists since the dawn of evolutionary theory itself. Um, but these are the challenges we face, and um, we look forward to unraveling some of the mysteries of the aging process. So I present to you first uh, Jean Calmet, uh, she's the world record holder in terms of longevity in the humans. She lived to the ripe old age of 122. And she actually did reach old age mentally sharp, physically fit, and financially secure. And she was very witty, and uh, you can imagine she was interviewed by many people and was always asked, what is the secret of your longevity? She always had a new answer, and my favorite was on the occasion of her 110th birthday. Uh, she was talking to the reporters, and she said, I quit smoking. She paused and she said, at 103. <laughs> so she did, a, she did well in terms of longevity, but of course aging itself is a process of decline, and we know this, a decline in tissue structure, function, and basically um, loss of function as we get older. And I think Shakespeare said it differently in As You Like It, he wrote, and so from hour to hour we ripen right, 
and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, <laughs> and thereby hangs the tail. So a rather bleak view of aging. We try and take a little more optimistic view of aging. And in my laboratory, we study actually muscle aging, skeletal muscle. So we try and understand what changes with age, and、um, we start with looking at typical skeletal muscle of, say, young adult males, as you might see wandering around the Stanford campus. And so, <laughs> could you go back one slide? So this is a typical male, and I know I looked like this when I was an undergraduate. But as you saw, with a, a few decades in holding political office, of course,、uh, that changes, and one sees kind of a loss of, of muscle bulk, a little bit of muscle atrophy. The muscle gets weaker, and this is really the question that we ask: what, Why does this change, and can we do anything about it? And what really is responsible for maintaining that healthy, youthful-looking muscle? And among those、uh, factors are stem cells, and stem cells can really be viewed as kind of a guardian. Of, of tissue structure and function, they really maintain tissues, whether it's muscle or skin or bone, in their healthy state. And in particular, they're responsible for repairing injury. And just as an example of that, I'll show you how stem cells in muscle seem to work. So this is a.、Um, a, a oops, sorry. Go back a slide. Back. Yeah. So this is a single large cylindrical cell, a muscle fiber that make up the the muscles of your body, and and it's an unusual cell and it has many nuclei that you can see here.、Um, you can't point it; doesn't work too well. But on the top, that red structure you can see is a single lone stem cell sitting in muscle. And these are rare cells; they remain quiescent and they're there to respond to different kinds of injury. And as an example of that. This is the normal appearance on the left of, of normal, healthy skeletal muscle. What you're seeing are these individual fibers, a group of them packed tightly and cut in cross section. So you're looking at them on FOSS. Well, in response to a type of injury, we use a kind of a toxin. That structure can be completely destroyed. And within that chaotic area, these stem cells are activating. They're beginning to divide. They line up, and ultimately, within a couple of weeks, they can pretty much restore the entire structure of that muscle. And this is a process that goes on all the time in some tissues of our body, like skin, the lining of our gut, the, the cells of our blood, which are always turning over. But then there are tissues like skeletal muscle or liver, which don't turn over very much, but with this kind of injury, can completely regenerate. And、so、that's a very important, normal process that ma maintains our healthy, youthful state. But what happens as we age? So you may recognize this fellow. So this is a, an older gentleman and younger male,、um, his son. And one of the characteristics of youth, <laughs> this Picasso and his son,、uh, is that injury to tissues of a young individual heal very quickly, very effectively, and very、uh, robustly. The same tissue, whether it's a skin injury or, or a bone fracture, in an older individual heals more slowly, less effectively, and often, often with some kind of scar tissue instead of really healthy repair. So we've really been interested in that process: can we understand it, and can we、um, do anything about it? So what I'll show you is just some some early data from the laboratory. We're just studying this process, and what we've done here is taken a young we study mice, young mice produced a little focal injury within the muscle, and what you're seeing on the on the right there is a microscopic image of that area that we've injured. It's in the process of regenerating, and we've stained it with a special stain that identifies newly formed muscle fibers in red, and those are each newly formed muscle cells. You see, they will fill in that area and and basically restore the normal architecture. Well, with age, as I mentioned, regenerative processes change, and so if we take instead of a young mouse, we take an old mouse and do the same kind of injury, what you see is a, a, a dearth of these newly formed muscle cells. And instead, what's happening in that injury is there a proliferation of a lot of supporting cells that ultimately form a scar. So we would like to understand what's wrong with that old muscle that doesn't allow it to repair as well as the young muscle. And the first question is, is does it run out of these cells, these stem cells? Well, the answer was a resounding no, and this seems to be true across the tissues of our body. We don't age and die because we run out of stem cells. The cells are there, but they're dormant, and they're just not responding to the cues of of the injury to activate.、And、so our question was, can we begin to look at these old stem cells and encourage them to activate and repair better? And we had some evidence that actually there are. Factors in old animals and old humans that suppress stem cell function, and in young animals that, that promote stem cell function. So we were trying to envision the kind of experiment where we could. 
basically expose these old cells to a young environment? Could we sort of trick them into believing they're in a young environment? And the way we did this was a curious experiment called parabiosis, or a procedure. And this is a process where we can take two animals, two mice, and conjoin them so they develop a single shared circulatory system, sort of like conjoined twins. And we can keep them that way for months, and they, they run around the cage and they eat and drink. And we took a young animal and connected to an old animal, two mice, and left them that way for two months. And then after that time, when that old tissue had been bathed in the circulating environment of the young animal, we injured the old muscle again. And what we found was that then the old muscle was able to regenerate just as well as a young muscle. So this is really a profound uh, finding. We were very excited by this, but of course, we can't use parabiosis in humans, <laughs> although we thought about it. So we began to dissect out what it is in the old, old environment, a young environment that's having these either repressive or stimulating effects. And we've been able to narrow this down now to a few key pathways that we think are really playing an important role in this sort of dormancy of the old, um, the old stem cells. And so what we've done here is we've done another small injury within the middle of the muscle, that central area is the injured area, the surrounding area is normal muscle. And if we just injure it in the old animal, the regeneration is poor. You see a lot of scarring going on in that area. But if instead we inject a single molecule into that injured area and allow the tissue to regenerate, we see very healthy regeneration like we see in a young animal. And that central area are these small, newly formed fibers that are going to get bigger and bigger like the surrounding fibers. So this is a painting of the Fountain of Youth by Grenache the Elder in the Weimar Republic in the 16th century, and this is a, his version of the Fountain of Youth. You have the bleak landscape on the left, and these are all women for some reason being carted in or carried in. They're examined, they're greeted by the young women in the pool who encourage them into the pool where they rejuvenate, become youthful, emerge on the, on the right, they get clothed and they enjoy all the, all the features of, of youth, of romance and fine dining in this beautiful landscape. So this is his version of what the Fountain of Youth would look like. And um, I don't think we've discovered the Fountain of Youth, but we certainly, I think, have unraveled some secrets of the aging process. So in terms of this colloquium, again, life-changing technology, we're certainly um, thinking of this as a, a therapeutic approach to acute injuries in older individuals, and can we develop um, these kinds of treatments that would actually rejuvenate stem cells in old individuals um, that could be used therapeutically in humans, and we're studying this as well as with biotechnology companies to try and develop this. We're obviously interested in this in terms of acute injuries, but also chronic changes that occur with aging, such as osteoporosis or muscle wasting. And with this, can we prolong health span by these stem cell therapeutics? Not so much extending lifespan, but extending that period of our life where we can remain healthy and active. So this is from the New York Times a few years ago, cover the Sunday Magazine, and there has been a long-standing fascination with immortality and extending lifespan, but I think what we're really working on here is trying to keep us physically fit as we do race towards our 150th birthday. So with, with that, I'll stop, and I thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, Roy? Good morning. I'm happy to join you as well for some thinking about learning in a network world. So this is a classroom image many of you may have in education. It was the kind of classroom I grew up in, and it's not all that different today. Instead, you have youth who are mostly wired and ready for tomorrow's education. They're not only having instruction delivered to them, they're creating online media content, their own artistic creations, stories, videos, blogs. And in this image on the left, note the girls' concurrent open channels of a cellular call, a MySpace social network, an iPod music player, several books, TVs, snacks, and what's happening is that many of today's digital natives who exploit these tools to understand and learn on their own find schools unchanged from those of their parents and certainly unconnected from their real-time ties to the web for information and their friends that they experience outside school. The world has changed tremendously. For example, did you know that Wikipedia, created only eight years ago, now features 13 million articles in over 200 languages written by probably some of you in the audience. 
that there's more video uploaded to YouTube in the last two months than if the three major networks had been airing continuously for 60 years. <laughs> That the computer in your cell phone today is a million times cheaper, a thousand times more powerful, and a hundred thousand times smaller than the one computer at MIT only 44 years ago. And finally, the biggest surprise perhaps is that the mobile device will be the world's primary connection tool to the internet in 2020 and the learning platform of tomorrow. So the next decade of technology-enhanced learning opportunities combines a few major trends. Very low cost, perhaps even free, always on smart mobile phones, a participatory media culture that you're seeing erupt in the last few years, social networks like Facebook being used for learning and education, not only for identity management, increasingly, <laughs> increasingly open, <laughs> educational resources that are tagged to learning standards. We're already seeing many thousands of courses from MIT, Stanford, and other places out there. One course alone on developing applications for the iPhone has been downloaded over a million times from iTunes University from Stanford. Much more accessible platforms for developing learning and educational tools. Immersive worlds and games, and not only World of Warcraft, but for learning substantive content, too. And location-aware services that take advantage of the GPS and your phone and other devices for learning in the world. So these developments promise uh, exceptionally wide access to technology, sophisticated tools, and with advances in the understanding of how people learn, this could provide a stunning opportunity to transform education worldwide. And these trends are so important because we can't even begin to physically construct the needed universities, schools, and classrooms to serve education needs, especially in the developing world. So right in front of our eyes, the learning and education platform of the future, of the century ahead, is emerging, and it's not the classroom or the school, although I deeply hope that schools and classrooms and educators can figure out how to harness these resources. So what has enabled these changes briefly? Many of you are experiencing these trends. Pervasive information and computing technologies. This is written on the back of 40 years of innovation, Stanford's invention with Doug Engelbart and others of personal computing. So now we have mobile devices connected with networks of all kinds, web technologies that enable people to share and access and publish and learn from online content and software across the globe. Convergence, this phenomenon is amazing. Professional tools such as desktop and laptop computers have now merged with personal technologies, those that we use for communicating, storing our personal information, playing our music, recording video, digital cameras. And finally, the network content today is far more interesting than the textbooks and videos that are in classrooms traditionally. Colorful visualizations for understanding complex topics, animated graphics, interactive applications. And for a sense of the trends here, at the end of this last year, one and a half billion people had access to the internet. By the end of this year, 4.6 billion people will be subscribed to a mobile phone, and these phones are turning into the mobile broadband of the future. So in one of our projects, we have funded by the National Science Foundation called the Learning in Informal and Formal Environments Center. We're looking at the sea of blue in this diagram as where most learning happens. Many of us think that formal education is the primary place where learning happens. It's the place where instruction happens. But in the little orange bits there, that's formal education. And so in the early years, the family is a tremendous influence, as is the community on learning. So too, as you move into the workplace, you're learning immensely from the social environments in which you participate. And as we move technology so that they're ubiquitously available throughout the day and throughout the lifetime, we need to treat the activities and the life experiences of the learner throughout the day as our units of learning, design, description, and explanation, far beyond the school. So for example, imagine a high school student in 2015. She's grown up in a world where learning is as accessible through technologies at home as it is in the classroom. And digital content is as real to her as paper, lab equipment, or textbooks today. At school, she and her classmates engage in creative problem solving, 
by manipulating simulations in a virtual laboratory, or by downloading and analyzing visualizations of real-time data from remote sensors. Away from class, she has seamless access to school materials and homework assignments using inexpensive mobiles. She collaborates on a continuous basis with her classmates in virtual environments that allow not only social interaction with each other, but with also with rich connections with a wealth of supplementary content and tele-mentors. Her teacher can track her progress over the course of lesson plan, compare her performance and aptitudes across a lifelong digital portfolio, making note of areas that need additional attention through personalized assignments and alerting parents to specific concerns. So the kinds of technologies that make scenarios like these possible, we call cyber learning. Recently, I worked for a half a year or so with a talented group that advised the National Science Foundation on the future of their investments in this area. And we defined learning as that, cyber learning as that that's mediated by networked computing and communication technologies. The cyber term, of course, comes both from cybernetics, Norbert Wiener's term, which was built on the Greek term for steering, but also a term from Washington called cyber infrastructure. And the point here is that if infrastructure is required for an industrial economy, then cyber infrastructure is required for a knowledge economy. So why is cyber learning important? Um, it's important because it leverages learning through communication technologies, through students' technological fluencies of the kind that we saw in the first slides, and because it extends the capacity of educational institutions into lifelong learning experiences to increase public understanding, and we hope, contribution to solving a host of complex global problems. An example of a project that we're advancing with these kinds of images in mind is funded by the Wallenberg Global Learning Network from Sweden, and we have some other partners here and colleagues in Sweden as well. It's called Let's Go for Mobile Science Inquiry. And in this project, we're focusing on learning ecology with technologies from science for global outcomes, uh, starting with two countries and hoping to expand. We're innovating learning science by doing science. This is for high school students at this moment on science content and inquiry strategies where we're leveraging a host of new tools, including science sensors that are inexpensive and robust, digital cameras for data capture and mapping, information visualization for analyzing these data, low-cost mobile computers, and pen-based paper computing for audio note-taking in the field. So these technologies are being brought together. We have the interdisciplinary contributions of uh, Professor Rudolfo Durzo in biology, who's a biodiversity expert, and just as a quick glance at some of the activities here with one of our local schools, similar things are happening in Sweden. Kids are out in their environment investigating water quality using these suite of technologies, comparing the pH for their pond and for creek water, discussing the potential reasons for that, um, displaying their data on this uh, science inquiry system, going back into the classroom, uh, working on these analyses and being able to visualize in a way that's very local to their school uh, and helps make this abstract set of conceptions very local, uh, their patterns of findings. So in closing, I want to say that I'm quite enthusiastic about participating at the moment uh, with Obama's team in creating a new national education technology plan. Uh, this is a plan that will hopefully guide the nation for the next few years in thinking about its investments and strategic priorities for learning and education technology. And whereas in the past, these plans have focused almost entirely on K-12 education technology, this is the first time that we'll be having an emphasis on pre-K to gray lifelong learning. So the question is, what does the nation need to do to invest in R&D, to create policies that are facilitative, Things like seat time requirements are kind of a, a bastion of the past uh, and move towards an opportunity for everyone to learn and be supported by good teaching and good resources for a lifetime. Thanks very much, Roy. Sally?
good morning. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. It's very exciting. And uh, I'm Sally Benson, and I'm the director of something called the Global Climate and Energy Project uh, here at Stanford University. It's a project that involves over 70 faculty members and over the lifetime of the project, more than 300 students. And the goal of our project is to develop the science and technology for a clean, sustainable energy future for the 21st century and beyond. So sitting here at this moment in time, we, we have the opportunity to imagine as that we revamp our energy system that we can say, well, how would we like to design this? Because we're certainly at the beginning of a transformation from a fossil fuel-based energy system to one that's probably based much more on relying on the sun and the wind and possibly biomass. So let's take, step back a moment and say, well, what would we like? And clearly, it's evident that energy is really the lifeblood of our modern civilization today. Many of the comforts, the pleasures, the necessity of permanent um, per personal mobility would not be possible without access to energy. So if we look at this energy system, there are a number of dimensions. There's a social dimension where clearly accessibility is a key issue. And then with regard to the economy, clearly we need an affordable energy system. And with regard to the security of our nations, we want to make sure that we have reliable, uh, abundant supply of energies to meet our needs. And then finally, and perhaps the most important driver today, the urgent driver today, is that we need an energy system that's protective of the environment and particularly protective of our climate system, which we now know is vulnerable to the increased concentrations of carbon dioxide that we put into the air when we burn fossil fuels. So this is what we would like to do design, but, but we have actually a tremendous challenge in that today we have about 6.5 billion people on Earth, 1.6 billion people here don't have access to energy today, and if we look out to 2050 or so, we might have more than 9 billion people here on this planet who need this accessible, affordable, uh, secure, and protective energy system. So the question we work on is how do we meet the growing needs for energy while at the same time protecting the planet? So our project, as I mentioned, involves many faculty from around the university, and we perform very fundamental scientific research looking for science and technology breakthroughs that will allow us to achieve this sustainable energy system. And this pie chart just gives you a sense of the breadth and the diversity and richness of research that's going on here at the university, cutting across almost uh, every department in engineering and, and, and the sciences. So just to give you a brief snapshot, so we do a lot of work on renewable energy, very, very important, particularly the sun and the wind, tremendously large resources. So we do a lot of work to develop new solar cells that would be less expensive than the energy we get from the electrical grid today today using very advanced uh, material science um, that allows us to take advantage, for example, of what we're learning about nanoscience and nanotechnology. We also work on trying to make biofuels much more efficient. We've heard a lot about ethanol perhaps is not as efficient as we'd like it to be. So we're looking at new approaches for growing crops and processing those to, to extract more energy from those crops. We also work in hydrogen. We hear a lot about the potential of a hydrogen economy. What's cool about it is if you use hydrogen and you burn it, so to speak, well, all that comes out the other side is water. So there's been a real dream that perhaps we could convert to a hydrogen economy. But where do we get the hydrogen from? So we're working on biological ways of producing hydrogen. Uh, but then we need to store the hydrogen. We need to be able to put it in a car, for example. So we're working on new novel chemistries that would allow us to store hydrogen at a very high energy density. We also work on uh, fossil fuels. 85% of the energy that we get today is, uh, comes from fossil fuels, putting carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. So certainly we'd like to be able to use these much more efficiently, and we have research going on that would allow us to have an engine that could be more than 60% efficient. Uh, very, very exciting work. Also. Can we make uh, coal clean? We're working on completely new ways of using coal that would have zero emissions into the atmosphere. And then finally, we also do work on batteries and electrochemical fuel cells. Fuel cells that could be uh, very efficient for using energy. And also batteries. We, we actually have a technology that could store 10 times as much uh, energy in a battery based on very uh, exciting uh, silicon nanowire technology that's being developed here. 
So these are the kind of things we work on. And uh, we, we, we hear a lot about uh, solar energy and, and we hear a lot about hydrogen and, and electric cars. So I thought I'd actually spend my last time with you talking about a technology you might not have heard so much about. And that's a technology called carbon dioxide capture and storage. I mentioned that 85% uh, of the energy we use today comes from fossil fuels. It is unsustainable to burn that unless we can find a way to reduce emissions. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this technology. So the basic idea behind carbon dioxide capture and storage is that instead of letting the carbon dioxide go into the atmosphere after we burn, say, natural gas or burn coal, that we scrub it from the gases. So we already learned how to scrub particles, we learned how to scrub sulfur, we know how to scrub nitrogen. So now the next in this evolution of making fossil fuels cleaner is to learn how to scrub carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's the basic idea is that you scrub that out. And one of the reasons this is so important is, is that 60% of all of our carbon dioxide emissions actually come from what are called stationary sources, like power plants or industrial sources. And uh, whereas we often tend to think about transportation fuels and so forth as, as carbon dioxide emitters, well, it's really these stationary sources that are so important. And there have been a number of studies, economic studies, which suggest that unless we can do this, unless we can scrub this carbon dioxide from the power plants, it's going to be extremely difficult to achieve the rapid reductions of, in emissions that we need to, uh, to achieve over the next 50 to 100 years or so uh, in order to keep the temperature from increasing, say, more than 2 or 3 degrees centigrade. So that's the basic idea behind the technology. It involves four different steps. You have to capture the carbon dioxide or scrub it, like I mentioned. You then compress it, uh, and then you put it into a pipeline. And then the question is, is, what do we do with all this carbon dioxide? Because there's a lot of it. Well, it turns out that the most practical uh, solution is to take that carbon dioxide and put it back underground. So you can imagine putting it in oil reservoirs or gas reservoirs, or there are also vast underground formations that are filled with very salty water that we would never use, and you can put it there. So that's the last little bit I'm going to talk about. That's what we do in, in my laboratory. And, uh, and there are a couple of questions. If this is the first time you've heard about this, you might be saying, well, for goodness sakes, how much could we put underground? And, and second, the uh, next question is always, well, won't it just leak back out? Well, there are uh, studies uh, similar to the studies we do to uh, assess the capacity of oil and, and gas reservoirs or the, the reserves of oil and gas reservoirs. We can assess the capacity to sequester CO2, and these suggest that it will be quite high, hundreds of years whether, uh, worth of storage security. Uh, of storage capacity, and, uh, and there are also studies which suggest that it won't leak back out. But we are academics, we do research in the geosciences, and so we want to answer these questions for ourselves. So we're using some of the most uh, advanced tools of modern science to be able to actually take a look at what CO2 would be if it was stored in a rock. And the picture up on the, your right-hand side shows actually a microtomogram. They're a very, very high-resolution 3D X-ray tomogram of a rock, showing the red part is where the sand grains are, the, the green is where the water is, and those little black dots are where the carbon dioxide is stored. So we can see that the carbon dioxide is actually trapped as little tiny droplets inside the rock, that we're not putting carbon dioxide in the underground lake or river or whatever. So that's some of the kind of work we can do. And we can also, uh, again, using, uh, in this case, medical imaging technology, we can figure out how much carbon dioxide could we actually put in the rock. And uh, the image on the right shows that uh, we could put about 35% uh, of the pore space could actually be filled with carbon dioxide. So that's pretty good. So, so moving on to the last question is, is well, what about leakage? There are studies and there are theories that would suggest that, in fact, it could be safely uh, and securely stored, but we would like to know. So we've developed a new technology with a startup here in, in, in the valley that uses car uh, carbon-13 isotopes to detect the carbon dioxide. And this was the first ever experiment uh, conducted this summer up in Montana. 
And we were extremely, whoops, could you go back one, excited uh, in that uh, we, we made these measurements over a controlled leak um, that was intentionally put there so we could see if we could detect it. And in fact, this new instrument uh, has tremendous capability to detect very, very small leakage. So we feel very um, satisfied that in fact we can make a big contribution to making sure this technology is safe and effective. So uh, I'd just like to, to wrap up and say that uh, there's a passion and a fire in the heart of the students and the faculty uh, to work on, on energy here at Stanford University. Uh, the creation of the Precord Institute for Energy even moves that one level further, and there's really not a better place, I think, on this earth for faculty and students to pursue uh, the vision and the dream of a clean and sustainable energy system. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sally. Sam? Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I represent a group of about uh, 150 scientists here on campus that work in the area of detecting disease, including cancer, at the earliest possible stage. And really, while those 150 scientists do all the work, I end up going to meetings like this to get volunteers to inject spies. <laughs> and um, to ensure that I will succeed today, I've got several large escorts in the back. <laughs> and um, they're going to make sure we get a few hundred people today for these spies. So let me tell you a little bit about how this particular area works. Um, I want you to think that we're part of an alien race, and probably many of us are. And, um, we're going to be given the task of studying the planet Earth. And the human body is much like the planet Earth, very complex with many cities, the houses in the cities, much like the cells in our bodies. And it's very difficult to really try to detect disease in the body, especially at the earliest possible stage. And if we're part of this alien race, you might begin by sending a satellite to the planet, in this case, the planet Earth, and start to take photographs from the satellite. And that's one of the ways in which radiology actually works now. We send satellites, if you will, and those satellites start to take photographs. Usually focus on the craziest parts of the body first. I'm sure you'd all agree <laughs> uh, we'd choose this, this particular city. And we're going to, of course, come in and start to kind of look at the freeways, and we're going to start to look at how things are moving around in the city, but we're still really not going to be fully happy with what we're seeing. In fact, as much as the kinds of images that CT scanners produce right now, CAT scanners, that are quite powerful, they let us look, for example, at the freeways in our body, the blood vessels, feeding the bones and tissues, of course, letting us detect some level of disease, but still, we need to do better than that. We need to be able to reach much further and deeper into the body so that we can detect disease earlier and earlier. And in fact, uh, you might say, well, come on, we do better than that. We can see things like organs, like the heart beating, and we have these beautiful images that show us what's really going on. But even with this level of a satellite, if you will, taking pictures, we're still not seeing the building blocks of our body and that is the trillions and trillions of cells that, in fact, build our bodies where things start to go wrong. And as modern biology starts to unmask what's going wrong in our cells, what really leads to disease, so must then imaging somehow start to go to that level to image what goes wrong. Whether it's genes coming on that shouldn't be on, whether it's genes being turned off that shouldn't be off. The human cell, as we understand it, is a complex beast that goes from genes that are expressed to proteins, and it's these proteins that do the jobs in your cells. Some proteins give the cell its shape, much like this room has shape. Cells are not two-dimensional as shown here, they're three-dimensional. 
and the proteins form girders and rafts to give the cell a structure. Other proteins become receptors to let the cell communicate with the external world. Other proteins become transporters to bring things in and out of cells. And yet other proteins become enzymes to help us metabolize nutrients. And then finally, many proteins serve in the role of controlling the process of what genes are turned on and off. And the more we learn about cells, the more we realize that this complex circuitry inside the cell is what we need to see in order to detect when disease is occurring at the earliest possible stage. So really, if you were part of this alien race sent to study the planet Earth, you'd eventually come to the same realization that the imaging community has come to. And that is that the only real way to study something as complex as the human body and the cells within the body are to go into the body itself. If we're going to look at a city and look at where the bad guys hide out, where the good guys are, how people behave, what better way to do it than to beam yourself down to the planet and, in fact, observe everything without giving yourself away. I want you to turn to the person to your right and look very carefully at them, okay? <laughs> are they human? Are they not? <laughs> If they're your spouse, you're definitely convinced they're not, okay? But that's what we're doing. We're saying, let's put molecular spies into your body, and let's let those spies observe what's going on to detect the bad guys, the bad things. And these spies do a house-to-house -house search. They go from cell to cell to cell looking for problems, looking for the problems that, in fact, are signs of early disease. So what we've been doing for the last decade or so are taking this analogy, building these molecular spies, These spies are not yet good enough to catch any disease. We usually have to build one spy for finding breast cancer, one spy for finding lung cancer, even spies for finding early Alzheimer's. The spies have their specificity because of the chemistry, and then they have a signaling system, kind of a walkie-talkie, shown here as this red box. That walkie-talkie lets the spy send signals back to us so that as we are outside your body as physicians, we can see that the spies have detected a problem. We often test these spies in small animals first. We run literally mouse clinics. The mice don't pay well, but in fact, they do end up letting us test these spies. You're looking at two mice in which spies have gone into the bloodstream, have found a tumor, and are sending a signal through, in this case, radiation, and in this case, light. Whatever the mechanism they signal to us with, we test their safety, we test their ability to find very few problem cells, then we move them into patients. And that's where you come in as a volunteer. <laughs> and these spies, then, are very good within a few hours of moving throughout your body and finding the site of disease. In the pictures that are shown here at the bottom, the spies have actually been eliminated uh, for the most part and have come out in the bladder. That black spot you're seeing towards the bottom of this human is actually spies that the person has peed out, okay? And we are always looking for ways to make these spies better so we can detect lower and lower amounts of disease. Now, the journey of a spy is very difficult because you have to disguise yourself and you can't give yourself away because the body will then try to destroy you. So whether you're headed to the liver to look for a cell that's a problem cell in liver cancer or anywhere in the body, there are many barriers you have to cross through. And you sometimes have to, of course, get into the cell. And when you get there and latch on to your target, you have to send the signal that you found a problem target. So the whole science of doing this is rapidly growing. And in fact, we've become better and better at building spies against different diseases that we wish to find in you. The signaling box is like a walkie-talkie. It can be almost any part of the physical spectrum. We can even have light coming from out of your body now. We send spies that produce light, and red light in particular does a good job getting out of you. And here is an example of this in a patient. 
the lungs that you're seeing in sort of that gray scale are the normal anatomy. You wouldn't know there's any cancer there. But the spies have gone, and in this case, in hidden lymph nodes, identified the presence of lung cancer hidden in the lungs. And these spies have done that because they have the chemical specificity to do so. The spies can also be used not just to detect disease, but to monitor disease. In this poor patient's case, there is cancer throughout the entire abdomen and liver. All those black areas you're seeing are all cancer. The spies are telling us that there's cancer in all those cells. But now, if you in fact treat this person, in this case with a new wonder drug, and put spies back into the person 24 hours later, you can see that the cancer cells are shutting down. The anatomy is not actually changing, but the cancer cells are shutting down. And in fact, over seven days, two months, and five and a half months, the spies keep telling us that the person is in fact recovering to normal. So the whole world can be changed by going into the body. Instead of looking from the outside, let's send spies within us. And as long as we can build these safely, as long as we can build them to in fact detect the lowest amount of disease, we should be able to lead to a better tomorrow for all of us, and Stanford is leading the way in doing so. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sam. Chris? Well, good morning, everyone. Let me lead off by saying that I love cars. And I'm hoping that I can share some of that passion with you here this morning. But I'm going to be the first to admit that the way we work with cars today is simply not sustainable. The US uses a vast amount of, of oil every single day. And if you look at where it goes, about 55% goes into highway vehicles, so cars and, and trucks. Now, we've got about 4.5% of the world's population. We're using about 24% of the world's oil production. And the rest, the other 95% of the world, would love to have the mobility that we take for granted. So this is simply not a path that we can continue on. But I think there's another aspect to sustainability with vehicles that, that's severely lacking, and that has to do with safety. If you look, every year there are over a million traffic deaths annually, and they estimate it's hard to get exact numbers, but approximately 23 million people worldwide are injured. It's an international problem, and in fact, in the US, it's a leading cause of death for everyone between ages three and 33. The competition on the low end and the high end are simply health problems. So as we do better with health, we're actually going to do worse in this area. Now, only 10% of these million fatalities are in the Europe, uh, the US, Japan, and Korea. So a lot are taking place in the developing world. And the estimates of the cost of this are it's approximately 1% to 3% of, of GDP. So we've got some huge problems with cars today. And in fact, these huge problems have competing solutions. So if you take a look at it and think about where the gasoline is going, if you simply look at the ratio of mass, we're using about 92% of the gasoline to transport the mass of the vehicle. Only about eight of that is going to transport the driver and passenger. So we could do a lot if we make cars lighter, but in fact, if we make cars lighter, we make them much less resistant to crashes. Uh, there was an estimate in 1997 that gave a trade-off of about 45 kilograms of mass, resulting in 300 more fatalities a year in the US. Now, you could do a lot with advanced materials, and I don't want to disparage that. But what I'd like you to think about is maybe we could go a different way. Maybe we could solve both of these problems at once by breaking the link. Can we make cars that can't crash? If we can do that, then in fact, we can make them much lighter and much safer at the same time. Now, how would we do that? Well, we need at least three things. First of all, we need cars that are aware of their surroundings, that can take some action, and that can take any possible action to get out of an accident. Now, I'm not actually a huge expert on sensing, but this is Stanford. So all I have to do is walk over to the Gates building, and here I find my colleague, Professor Sebastian Thrun. Now, Sebastian, you may know for his uh, excellent work in the DARPA Grand Challenge and Urban Challenge. And this is his car, Junior, and a sense of the surrounding environment uh, that it gathers from a LiDAR sensor. So it scans the environment and can build a map of the world around it that it can then use to reason and act. Now, uh, Junior, in fact, is using a lot of production actuators, steering systems, braking systems, uh, throttle systems that are available on your current car today. Uh, but it's using those in a new way to actually navigate through the environment. 
Now, in my lab, uh, Stanford students have put together P1. Uh, this is a fully electric drive-by-wire, steer-by-wire car. It looks a little bit like a go-kart, but it actually handles like a sports sedan. And it was built by a team of five Stanford students in about 15 months from a clean sheet of paper to the first moving test. Uh, we left out a few things like the rich Corinthian leather and the body panels uh, in order to do that. But it has a number of, of capabilities. It has independent front steering. If you don't like the situation, you can actually snowplow your tires and brake. And it has independent rear electric drive. We could drive one wheel, regeneratively brake the other, and turn it. We have a lot of capabilities to move. So how do we do that? How do we coordinate all these things in a way that's going to allow us to avoid any possible accident? Well, who do we know who it regularly hangs out at the limits of the physical capabilities of the car? Race car drivers. So we've been looking to racing for inspiration to this and how we can design these systems. And in particular, we've been become very interested in rally racing. So in rally racing, it's an off-road form of racing where these drivers will throw themselves into blind corners as fast as they can possibly go, not knowing what the road conditions are, not knowing what's ahead of them. It's, in fact, an analogous situation that some of our autonomous vehicles may counter. And we want to figure out how are they doing this? How can we emulate this characteristic? Those of you with small children may already know the answer. In fact, if you've seen the movie Cars, uh, you, in fact, heard the, uh, the advice from Doc Hudson to Lightning McQueen, which is simply that you have to turn right to go left. And that's, in fact, what we're doing here. Uh, we had to get a little bit more mathematical uh, on this. So in fact, actually, what we found out was this is an unstable equilibrium. This is what's known as a phase portrait. And I put this up because Stanford alums to whom I've described this work have said, you mean you can use those things for something? So if you learn this here, there is a use for it. If you didn't learn it here, it's very easy to see uh, what the results are, which is that there's a relationship between how fast you want to turn and how much you're sliding. And if you can get it just right, you can go around the corner in a way that leaves your options open. You want to tighten the corner, you have that capability. You need to make it a little wider, you have that capability. But it's very, very unstable. So only a skilled driver can do this. So what rally car drivers are doing is trading stability for controllability. And we've actually had some fun talking to rally car drivers. And all of them, when they discuss their style, have really some version of this that they will qualitatively explain why they do this. So we wanted to see, can we do this? Can we drift sideways autonomously? So we went out and did some tests. This is a gravel surface in our test vehicle. So the car puts itself into a turn and begins to drift. It's a little hard to film this. Again, hard on the cameraman. But in fact, we can do it. We can turn right to go left. There's more than one way around a corner. We believe we're actually getting to the point where we can use all of the capabilities of the car to avoid any possible situation that can be avoided. And as we're learning to do this, we're learning to do this in ways that actually don't require putting the vehicle sideways. Although, boy, does that make it easy to attract graduate students. <laughs> now, this leads to an interesting point. Are we going to be able to drive our cars in the future? And enjoying cars as we do, if, if we're fully autonomous, that, that may not be as appealing, at least to me. So we've been looking at, are there ways to work cooperatively with the driver? Now, if you look at fatalities in the US, about 40% of those are due to the vehicle simply leaving the lane, not a loss of control. The first harmful event is a vehicle leaving the lane and colliding with a fixed obstacle. Now, we could do a lot if we could just keep the car in the lane and sort of nudge it back to the center. And so we're looking at this virtual world, if you will, where you can kind of think about the roads as being curved. Now, roads are actually now uh, graded so that the water will roll off. But if we could kind of create the opposite effect by steering the vehicle slightly, we could maneuver you back to the center of the lane. Now, right now, automotive manufacturers spend a lot of effort to make sure that your car will return to center when you let go of the steering wheel. What we can do is simply make it return to lane center. And if we look ahead a little bit on the road, we can make your vehicle return to the center and make sure that it will never go unstable. We can look ahead a little bit so if you start to go sideways, your vehicle countersteers, just like a rally car driver. 
So we've tested this as well in terms of working with it. And it, what it does is it gives you the ability to kind of think about the vehicle as just a marble in a valley. And actually, mathematically, it works out pretty much the same way. So we went out and tested this as well. You're going to see the first time we tried this. So we're going around. We're not steering. We're just accelerating. And we stay. We're pretty happy. And so my uh, grad student continued to uh, accelerate. We're going around this corner way too fast. But all it does is kind of stretch us out a little bit, like a spring attaching us to the center of the road. And when we let off, we snap right back. Never goes sideways, which is actually very easy to do in this car. And it stays on track. All right, so can people actually work with these systems? That's an interesting question, and we've been working with some psychologists on this, one of whom told me, you know, I think somebody proposed this in psychology back in 1930s. <laughs> no way. Well, actually, go into the stacks of Green Library, go to the American Journal of Psychology, and yes, in fact, in 1938, it was proposed that people drive by thinking of a field of safe travel in front of them. And so this is a paper by Gibson and Crooks. You almost expect Elliot Ness to get out of these vintage 1930s vehicles in this illustration, but showing that, in fact, there are some conceptual opportunities here to think about. Maybe we can design these in a way that will work with humans. And I think this brings up the point that, really, this is a question for psychology and social sciences. And I'm happy to say that we're starting an automotive research center here at Stanford. Sebastian Thruen, who I already mentioned, Cliff Nass, uh, who's in the communication department, we are looking at doing this cooperatively to look at questions like how we can interact with intelligent cars. And if we can make these lightweight, low-cost uh, vehicles, what might they look like? Will they have four wheels? Four wheels is actually a pretty good idea. Will they steer? Actually, it turns out steering isn't so good. If we could lean like a motorcycle or a bicycle, you could get a lot more capability out of the friction between the tire and the road. So these and many other questions, together with our colleagues in energy, about thinking about how we can look at powering cars in the future or what we hope to accomplish. So I'd like to close with one thought. We have a new home for this. If you go by Oak and Stock Farm Roads this weekend, you'll see the uh, construction taking place of our new building, which will house the Volkswagen Automotive Innovation Lab. And we have a new autonomous vehicle that we're introducing there, because what's the point of having a new home without a new car in the driveway? <laughs> so together, we think that with this facility, we're going to pull everybody together. We're going to get students, faculty, companies together, and we're going to look at really re-envisioning the automobile so we can drive without accidents. Thank you very much. <laughs>
what we're doing is really important and you explain it to somebody else and they say, what? Uh, and we need to get past that, but once we do, that's where the real value lies. Yeah, that may be a common theme. I was having a con conversation with Sam before we came in about his work, and you said it was exactly the same problem across disciplinary work was communication. You want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to echo that, we often have to bridge across departments, across schools to solve problems. For example, these molecular spies, a lot of the techniques in building them are through the chemistry department, and now material science where nanoprobes are developed, then physics for building instruments to detect them. The biggest problem in bridging across science is communication. And it's not just weeks or months. It typically takes us years to really be able to bridge across languages. We all become very jargonized, if you will, in our disciplines. And to break through those jargons to be able to communicate effectively is a grand challenge, but one that leads to very fruitful interactions and then very important science and solutions to healthcare problems. So yeah. uh, I'll add a little to that. I, I agree with everything that we've heard so far that you know, to solve the problems that I work on, I need to work with phys physicists and chemists and so forth. But if you look at the energy system, uh, and think how complex that is. We have electrical engineers who operate the grid. We have material scientists who are developing the next generation of solar cells. We have fluid dynamicists working on wind. Uh, we have economists who tell us what we can afford and how to fit all the pieces together. We have behavioralists who, who uh, provide us uh, uh, information about what kind of technologies people are, are willing to adopt. So we really do need to break down all those barriers because it's an incredibly complex system and we need to move past thinking of it in a piecemeal way and thinking about it as an extraordinarily complex system and really need to work together. Great. Right, I mean. the, the thing we often say in our interdisciplinary work on learning and technology is that the problems when they come at us are not carved up by the discipline, so we can't approach them in that way. Um, and so we'll have psychologists and anthropologists looking at learning. We have a neuroscientist that has to understand, well, what's, how's the brain changing as it learns? The anthropologist wants to know how are people performing differently, interactively. The psychologist wants to know how are the mental states changing. Um, so. And, and of course, in the disciplines, when we study learning in a discipline, we need the subject matter expertise. So these groups have to come together and design with educators as well. Okay, Tom? Yeah, I would say in the, um, in the Longevity Center, obviously the issue of aging and the aging demographic is fundamentally of, of interest across every uh, school at the university. And we are, in fact, uh, our faculty affiliates range from molecular biologists to demographers, economists, psychologists, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And while the, the questions are posed in a disciplinary way, um, so much more has been achieved already by bringing people together who, who ask questions in a different way, but whose answers impact each other. If we improve health, what does that mean for economics? If we improve economics, what does that mean for design of cities and so forth? So I think it allows us to ask questions by interacting across disciplines that we wouldn't even think of mm -hmm. and have been much more illuminating than our own individual questions alone. Yeah. Okay, I think we have people lined up at the microphones. Why don't we start over here uh, on your right and then move over here and then <coughs> I, it's, I have a hard time seeing in the balcony if there's anything up there. Okay, so let's start over here though, please. Good. Hi, I have a question for uh, Sally Benson. You, uh, you presented a research portfolio basically on your work in uh, trying to develop the foundations for a sustainable energy system or a new sustainable energy system. I was rather surprised that the nuclear was not included mm -hmm. since, as you know better than I, uh, some countries such as France generate more than 50% of their energy from nuclear uh, plants and some countries such as China are investing rather aggressively in nuclear. Why is Stanford not interested in nuclear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, th that's a really good question. And, uh, and I, I think the answer is we certainly are interested in, in, uh, in nuclear energy. Um, however, within our program, the Global Climate and Energy Project, we always have to ask ourselves, uh, what is the really fundamental scientific breakthrough we can achieve if we do a certain piece of work, what will be our contribution to the furtherment or advancement of that area? In, in the area of nuclear energy, these tend to be very large coordinated programs run primarily with government support uh, together with partnerships with uh, uh, the large corporations who are in those areas. So I, I totally agree, nuclear power is extremely important. 
um, but we just didn't see a place for it in our particular portfolio for, for the Global Climate and Energy Project. Thanks. Over here. This is for Professor Randall. It has to do with um, stem cells and kind of more in the layman's term. I participated in the Senior Olympics that um, were here in, in the summer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that um, I was starting to notice was um, one of my athletic friends was showing me uh, this bottle that was supposed to be, you know, for stem cell therapy, and she, you know, she really touted it and everything. So I guess I kind of have two questions, you know, are these, is this snake oil, <laughs> you know? Because the literature she's giving me, she, you know, she just swears by it, she's very athletic. She says, oh, all of her injuries have gone away, or not gone away, but you know, you know, we're talking, you know, she's 68, she participated in three events and all. And, you know, she, you know, oh, I'm well, you know? And so my other question is, so, you know, are those pills viable, you know? And then the other question is, how do I really research it without, with an honest, unbiased scientific research on these pills or whatever, as opposed to a lot of it is surreptitiously by the company, you know, touting their product? Oh, well, it's, a, it's an important question. I mean, when we first um, started to publish our work on this kind of improvement of stem cell function, the main interest was from men's health magazines. Those are all the phone calls. You know, is it, <laughs> that was the primary interest. Um, I don't know specifically about this treatment, but all I could say is generally there are uh, countless uh, treatments and, and pills and remedies and so forth that have not undergone scientific study. Um, I don't know what that would be that you would be taking, but even, even the kinds of supplements that people take, like glucosamine and chondroitin, that might be beneficial. A lot of times they're used because they might help and they, and they do no harm. Um, they're natural substances of the body, but I would be very skeptical, is all I can say, is that uh, anything that's touted as a stem cell therapeutic that you can take by mouth, I don't know what that would even be at this point. And, uh, and you know, I, I would be very careful. Clearly, this extends beyond uh, drugs or pills to where people in other countries are offering stem cells right. as therapy injected into bodies as cures for diseases. And again, they have not undergone scientific study, and I know very little about what has gone behind them, but I would be cautious. Thanks. Good. Was there somebody up in the balcony who had? There's a, okay, right there. please. It's Ralph Tegel, class of 57, mechanical engineer. My question was on the energy portion that we have putting too much CO2 in the air. And uh, just to take the, the CO2 and sequester it and put it down into the ground, I think it's a little bit simplistic. Uh, we might want to step back and say, what are the benefits of the increased CO2? If our population of our Earth keeps on growing, we need more plant life. We need the CO2 for that. What we should be studying is the disruptions in the weather patterns, which might be more gainful. And uh, I think uh, we should also look at how nature handles the CO2 by combining it with other elements. I'm not a chemical engineer, but I know you have calcium carbonate, lead carbonate, and others which can very efficiently uh, take up the CO2. Silly? Sure. Um, so, so, so to your first point about um, increased carbon dioxide concentra uh, concentrations uh, improving biological productivity, uh, in fact, this is known to be true. Uh, if you buy tulips and they are grown in a greenhouse, they often, quote, fertilize those tulips by increasing the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere uh, of the greenhouse. Um, there have been many studies about the potential magnitude of this effect, including some seminal studies by Chris Field uh, uh, here at, at Stanford University. And what has been found is that there is a saturation effect, and beyond a certain point, you don't, uh, in fact, get stimulation of, of biological productivity anymore. So it's simply not helpful uh, after a certain point. Um, that's also a, a physics or, or a biogeochemical process that's incorporated into most uh, global change models that are used to forecast how carbon dioxide changes over time. And, and in fact, the bigger concern right now is because that's such an important part of those models, uh, people are concerned that if this biological fertilization effect isn't as, as strong, 
as has been incorporated into the models, that in fact that the carbon dioxide concentrations could even rise more rapidly. So that's our current understanding of that issue, but you're absolutely right that, uh, that there is the, the, this effect. And just to say a little bit more about uses of, of carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide is used today to enhance oil recovery. Actually, that's the major use of carbon dioxide. Um, uh, we also put it in soft drinks. Uh, and there are people who are working on, on, on growing algae by uh, using carbon dioxide, which is very interesting. And you could convert that algae into biofuels. And in fact, that's a new area of research that we're just beginning to take a look at. Uh, there's also research looking at trying to make cement-based, uh, cement-like materials uh, with uh, using carbon dioxide. So these are all very exciting opportunities. However, at the bottom line is that the sheer scale, the magnitude of the carbon dioxide that we use is, is so great compared to any potential uh, beneficial reuse that we, we can mat imagine. That, that at the end of the day, we do need to work on reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And, and there are all kinds of ways to do that. We can use less energy. We can be more, have more efficient technologies. We can use renewable energy. We can use nuclear power. So I, I didn't talk about carbon dioxide capture and storage to say this was the solution. I thought it would be interesting to talk about because it's somewhat newer than the other ideas that are presented. And, uh, and I thought it would be a good uh, opportunity to open a dialogue about that. So, Thanks. long answer. <laughs> Good, Sorry. Oh, thanks. It was very helpful. <laughs> I have a question for Dr. Gambier. How does the uh, molecular spy research translate into preventative medicine? We all go every year and have a physical and find out what's cooking. And um, how do you envision this being part of that whole process so we it so that we don't get into metastasized things and whatever. Mm -hmm. So before I answer that, just so you're aware, the fine print on the brochure says that anyone asking me a question has to volunteer. What, what you ask is very relevant in that disease, of course, needs to be tackled at the prevention level, we would love to be able to take these technologies from earlier detection to even prevention. One of the ways that's likely to occur is through spies that live with you. That is, right now, most of the spies that we develop are only with you for a little bit of time, usually hours to days, and then, as you saw, they're peed out. What we'd like to do is move towards spies that are your little buddies that are basically with you and are detecting the earliest possible time of disease, including helping you to prevent disease. We're nowhere near that level of technology and innovation, but I think you rightfully asked the question that that's what we need to aim towards. Healthcare dollars can be markedly reduced if instead of spending what we do now, which is a thousand times more at late stage disease, shifting it to earlier stage, and then better yet, shifting it to prevention. Mm -hmm. Great. Hi, Good morning. Up Ron Romine, Stanford Law, 1969. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor P. I'm just wondering, um, as you look at the, uh, the advent and the growth of, of the internet and personal information devices and so forth as the uh, preferred uh, medium for, for learning. Uh, one of the things that's very concerning, I think, maybe particularly to some of us older alums, is that um, w what is the effect, uh, what are the effects going to be on uh, morals and ethics and just the, uh, the, the development of, of the rules of civil uh, discourse and norms in our society where people more and more, stu younger people particularly, tend to have their interactions with their device rather than their peers and, and, it's, and social discourse seems to diminish as the growth of the interactions with these personal devices grows. <laughs> Yeah, the research is still out on that question, but people are certainly observing the fracturing of norms around social discourse. It's hard as a parent to not have a child at the table who's not messaging in some way, 
with their peers. Uh, unfortunately, we model that in the boardroom as well, so people are blackberrying uh, in the midst of meetings. Um, uh, we talk a little bit about the phenomena of always elsewhere, that people are with multiple devices interacting somewhere other than where they are. And I think the moral panic that that creates for some people is the sense that you'll walk into a room and not be as interesting as all the distractions that are on the device that the person has. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, this is a, a social question about norms, about values, and it's, it's not being made by somebody else. We are making those new norms in how we behave on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So I urge all of you, push back. <laughs> <laughs> In the balcony, please. Were there uh, any? Yes, my question is also for Professor P, and I'm just curious to know how we help our young people uh, understand the validity of the information they're getting from all their network devices. All information is not created equal. Uh, how do we help them establish judgment on that? And is this a curriculum question or a hardware question? How do you address this? Sure. Um, a lot of groups are working on issues of new media literacies, uh, one of which uh, it involves searching and finding information, but secondly, being able to critically evaluate it for its reliability, credibility, bias, um, and uh, increasingly, I think that's gonna become uh, uh, something that not only educators, but parents as teachers and peers as teachers uh, will work uh, to foster. The MacArthur Foundation has funded a large program in digital youth and uh, media. Uh, that has developed some of these efforts. Uh, we have local teachers that are working on pilot curricula like that, but I think it's largely a curricular question um, and something that we uh, have to work very hard on. Thanks. Uh, this is a question for Professor Rando. Uh, I'm a sports writer with Yahoo.com, and I run into this question constantly. It's an ethical discussion about athletes who want the kind of you know, answers that you have to their injuries, anti-aging issues. Is there an ethical argument you can make that says to these athletes it's okay to use some of these things and says more importantly to the fans and people who pay for them, you know, pay their salaries, that it's okay to accept some of these things as a duty to society uh, to come up with better answers because there's an awful lot of resources dedicated to sports. So the ethical issues are, are, are very important when, when we start thinking about uh, the kind of technology I was talking about being applied not for the cure, a healing of an injury, but for the enhancement of performance or the prevention of aging. And, and really, the, the context in which we do our studies, in which I sort of think of this as a therapeutics, isn't in the context of healing injuries. I think that that would pass ethical muster in terms of if someone has a, a fracture or an injury, to whatever treatments we have that are approved and studied that can heal the injury would be fine. I think when one gets into the next level of people taking um, treatments or, or injections for enhancement, it's in the same realm as, as taking as, as a steroid sc scandal. So I think there is the same ethical issue to be dealt with in terms of whether these go beyond medical treatments for, for healing to enhancement or delaying of aging. So I would, I would, I'm not sure if that answers your question. I don't have an answer to the ethics of it, but I think that's where the, the decisions as a society have to be made as to when these treatments are useful for medical reasons as opposed for non-medical reasons. Well, I, I suppose the, the discussion is you have a lot of fans who are caught in tradition. You know, they, they remember whoever they grew up watching. They, uh, you know, they remember their records and they put those on a pedestal and they see modern athletes using greater technology to break those records, play longer, heal faster from injuries, and they're disturbed by that. And, but, but within sports, you can use some of that to get some more answers for yourself. Right, I mean, I, I, again, I, I still think there's a gray zone that certainly medical treatment for um, healing injuries has improved dramatically. I don't, people, people have not objected to that. Uh, per se in sports that I'm really aware of as a, as a controversy. If we can help someone get back on the field faster, um, I agree that does change the, the ability of an athlete to perform overall, but on the other hand, we try and prevent injuries and try and treat them. So I, I still think the gray zone is when it becomes something beyond that and, and where, where this would become a, sports will be an issue where these kinds of treatments will face this kind of ethical question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please. 
Yeah, Don Gray, uh, class of 66 in anthropology and the School of Education in 1970, the STEP program. Uh, I had a question again for Dr. Dr. P. Um, and following up on, on this idea of uh, cyber learning and the uh, mediation of uh, learning by technology, it really gets into a lot of these social political questions. Uh, you know, you can have swarming uh, where people suddenly descend on a site. Uh, trying to decide what is true and what isn't with uh, Wikipedia. You know, write yourself uh, your own article in the encyclopedia, and then is it accurate or not? The, the, uh, the double-edged sword of freedom that uh, the technology is bringing us creates a lot of uh, difficult problems in terms of governance and, uh, and the body politic, who are mobili mobilized oftentimes uh, in, uh, frankly, weird and psychotic directions. What, <laughs> what do you see as the, as the uh, uh, it, it, do any natural parameters exist within the technology to uh, lead us on the right path, or is it just all terra incognita? I, I think it's a human problem. Um, uh, the human values range from using the technology for healing uh, to terrorism. I mean, the same mobile devices that can be used to learn can be used to locate assassination targets. Uh, there is evil, <laughs> and uh, as well as good in the world. And I think the key issue here for the educator and for those of us that are concerned about uh, education and values, as, as John Dewey reminded us so forcibly uh, a century ago, um, it's, it's a continual conversation and everyone is a part of it. Um, and so as we look to see, you know, what are the new forms of knowledge creation, uh, of knowledge critique? Uh, Wikipedia is a good example. Uh, the fact that learners can be contributing to knowledge is a very powerful thing. Uh, at the same time, it raises the standards. Do they have authority to do so? But it's in the crucible of human discourse and debate in which those things emerge, and that is as it should be. Thank you. In the balcony. Yes, please. Dr. Rondo, what is the challenge as you develop therapies uh, for what I guess you could call pacing? For example, if you improve someone's skeletal system uh, or someone's muscle system, would it overstress the skeleton? Would it overstress the heart? Uh, and there's always the brain. How do you? Is the hope that you can bring all these systems along together? When I think of the, the actual therapeutic application of the work, I, I, I think of it fairly narrowly as in the healing of wounds. And that's where I think we can potentially safely um, use the kind of therapeutic that would be targeted both spatially to, to a, a, a joint, a bone, an area of skin, and temporally for a narrow period of time to cure the to cure the injury, to repair the wound. I think when, whenever it gets beyond that, and sort of relates to the last question, to where we're trying to actually, say, delay the aging process, it, I think we get into trouble, and I think it will have its own problems that will actually prevent us from doing that. And that is, if we can actually stimulate these sort of generically stem cells throughout the body, I think there's a reason why we don't as we get older. And I think the reason why we don't as we get older and why there's actually a suppression is to prevent cancer. I think the danger we would get into if we start to think of these as we're going to just promote um, maintenance and, and heal, uh, growth of muscle or bone or, or better uh, turnover of the blood or the skin, we're going to get into trouble with um, malignancies. So I think there's almost a self-limitation on applying this beyond a narrow temporal and spatial window. Um, and, and so I think the, the kinds of problems you're referring to would be avoided by the fact that we would be unable to do these chronically um, in any case. Good, please. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, you began to answer uh, my question, Dr. Randa, and that has to do with the, the differentiation of stem cells into malignant cells. Uh, is there much concern within the stem cell community that uh, ex vivo stimulation uh, and then introduction of stem cell, of those differentiated stem cells will lead to a higher risk of malignancy? Absolutely. That, that is. Uh, High, very high on the list of what the potential risks are, probably highest on the list, especially as we move away from the type of cells that I was referring to today, which are adult tissue-specific stem cells, the stem cells that sit in our, in our, in our bodies, in the skin, and in the gut, and repair, and repair and replace that tissue. As we start looking at cells like embryonic stem cells, or this new version of cells called induced pluripotent stem cells, which are like embryonic stem cells, the idea is that we grow up these cells in a dish, 
we can differentiate them to become one kind of tissue, and then we implant them, for certainly the greatest risk is that within that population of differentiated mature cells remain a few undifferentiated cells that will give rise to malignancy, and absolutely that does happen in animal models. So the, the safety issues when thinking about ex vivo, stem cells grown up in the laboratory and then transplanted into a person, the, the, the highest level of standard will be looking for the risk of cancer. I think we have time for one more question, so please. My question is for Professor P. When you, um, when you think about how wired our children are now and how you envision that playing out in the classroom in the future, how do you envision us getting from where we are now to that, um, both from a financial perspective and culturally? And I lay out for you one, one data point as a um, elementary school at LA Unified in the top 15% of those schools. Mm -hmm. And what we have in the classroom is less than a third of those classrooms have projection equipment and computers to be able to handle the new curriculum coming down the pike that involves mm -hmm. interaction. So, mm -hmm. so we're not prepared for that. And then when you look at the teachers, we have some excellent teachers who do not have email and do not communicate with students or parents via email. So we've got cultural challenges and financial challenges, and this is one of the better schools. So how do we get to where you're talking about? Sure. Um, there are four major aspects that different teams are working on in this, na this national education technology plan. There's a focus on learning, a focus on teaching, a focus on assessment, which is a big driver, and on the productivity of the system as a whole. And um, there's a lot of uh, interest in the Obama administration and how education can have the same benefits from technology that have been experienced in other sectors. Uh, and part of that is a state's issue. Uh, and they'd like the feds to stay out of the way. <laughs> At the same time, there is uh, on issues like having common standards. Uh, so there's, uh, in, in, the, in the curricula, that's a key issue for publishers. They're not able to uh, have a large enough addressable market unless there are uh, some common core issues. Teacher professional development programs uh, need to have more support for technology integration. There's a lot of science of learning there, but little uh, in, the, in the system. Instructional leaders uh, uh, need to be able to think hard about the kinds of data that come from assessments, that once there is more technology, one-on-one -on -one kind of computing models in the way that mobiles are enabling, uh, you could begin to have dashboards for helping steer teacher professional development resources or to focus on the needs of specific kids. And we do have the beginnings of experiments in early literacy, early mathematics, where you do have these one-on-one -on -one models and when you can get some very substantial achievement gains. But yes, the economic issues uh, are daunting uh, for education, and we can only hope that Moore's Law and other, and other uh, forcing functions that are making things smaller, cheaper, faster will make its way into education. Okay, we are about out of time. These were great questions, uh, great answers also. Uh, and I think it's time to turn it back over to Howard. Thank you very much. Since there was so much discussion during the conversation, I, I want to point out that there is a wonderful app on your iPhone um, if you want to access that for the Reunion Homecoming. And our crack team of developers during the course of this presentation has actually put a new button. If you'd like to volunteer to have a molecular spy put in your body, <laughs> it's the bottom button. All right. So before I... So before I dismiss you to go to your class lunches and your class panels and other activities, I have a housekeeping matter to attend to. I, I want to remind everyone here of the very special roundtable discussion being held tomorrow morning in Maples Pavilion. The panel is entitled, The Road Back, From Economic Meltdown to Recovery, How Will We Get There? It'll be hosted by John Hennessy, the president of the university, and moderated by Emmy Award-winning journalist Charlie Rose. In addition, the panelists include the following group of distinguished thought leaders. Stanford faculty member, professor of economics, Carolyn Hoxby. Alumnus, Guillermo Ortiz, Mexico's ambassador to the International Monetary Fund, as well as governor of the Bank of Mexico. Alumna and business executive, Penny Pritzker, who also serves on President Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. Stanford professor and newly named dean of the Graduate School of Business, Garth Saloner. And last but not least, Eric Schmidt, chairman 
of the board and CEO of Google, a small technology company which found its roots here at Stanford. E even in Stanford terms, th this is a stunning lineup and is certain to be a wonderfully provocative and tremendously educational event. Fully understanding that most of you will be attending a class party this evening, a class party that may go a little late into the night, we wanted to remind you of this event and remind you to set your alarm clocks. It will start at 9.30 a.m. sharp. So thank you again for joining us here today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the weekend. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.